Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's uh let me just get my act together here. I need to f- put on my phone and make sure that I have a timer in front of me. Wonderful. Here we go. Okay. So, good morning everyone. This is my last Sunday with you and uh thank you for being my hosts. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, spend the time with you. I pray that the things that I have sought to share with you will really be of benefit and of profit to you. You know, Jesus used to say to those who, the crowds who came to listen to him, he who has ears, let him hear. In other words, guys, I've given you what you need to know. And if you have heard me, go do these things and they will change your life. But if you're one of those who hears things and then, you know, wants to discuss them and wants to research them and wants to have a group, you know, meeting on them, the likelihood is that nothing will ever come out of them. Okay? He who has ears, let him hear. Last week we said that if you're living on more than 60% of your take-home salary, not your gross not your net, but your take home. What lands in your account at the end of the month or on your phone at the end of the month? You are living a lifestyle that is beyond what you can afford. I hope you went home and sat down with a pen and paper and figured it out for yourself, thought it through, and have taken the steps to correct what might be wrong and what needs to be set right again. Now, let me reinforce last week's lesson by giving you seven keys or seven signs that you're living beyond your means, okay? So if this is happening in your life, this is what I was saying last week, you're living beyond what you can afford. Number one, you never have any any money left over at the end of the month. Is there anyone who's like that here? Don't put up your hand. But you know, even getting to the end of the month is a stretch. You're just waiting for the 26th or the 28th or whatever time the money lands in your account. And you're always waiting for that ping. And if it doesn't ping, then you check into your account to see whether the money has come. And when it comes, there's a sigh of relief because now you can catch up with your bills. You're living beyond your means. A second sign is your bills are spiraling out of control. You can't keep up with them. There are things you have not accounted for. You're having to figure out, how am I going to pay that? I wasn't even aware. I borrowed a loan here. Somebody's asking for their money. They're spiraling out of control. You're borrowing from the kiosk. You haven't paid your school fees in full. You owe your doctor money. Your rent is behind. You, you have to collect the coins at the end of the month so that you can pay the mamamboga. And it just keeps going on and on and on. A third one is you carry a balance on your credit card. If you use a credit card, there is only one way to use a credit card and it is that at the end of the month before the due date, you pay the amount in full. Okay? If you find that you're not able to do that and that you, you know, you took petrol, you haven't paid, the end of the month has come and you're trying to find the minimum where they tell you you owe 20,000, but if you pay 10%, 2,000, the car is forward. You're living beyond your means. Guys, let me tell you this for a, a, a fact, okay? Your credit card company is not your friend. They are trying to make money off you. And the way they make money off you is they hope that you can't pay. Because when you can't pay, then they penalize you for not paying the full amount. Especially if you didn't even pay the minimum amount. And that's how they make their money. So they like to give their credit cards to people who can't afford a credit card. Who are not in control of their finances. The only way you can use a credit card well and it doesn't burn you and then the bank won't like you very much because they want people who keep getting burned every month. The only way you can use a credit card well is if you're able to clear the amount 
incomplete, you know, the whole 100%, and you never roll over anything. Then the bank figures, you know, this person has, has discipline that we cannot destroy. We need to tempt them. So they write you, and they tell you, your credit limit is 250000 but you are such a good customer, would like to increase it to five hundred, in the hope that now you will borrow beyond your means, and now you begin to default, and therefore now they are getting money. You're much safer using a debit card because you can only use the money that is already in your account if you're using a debit card. And so if you find you're rolling over your credit card, you do two things with it. Number one, half step number one, is give it to a friend or give it to your spouse and tell them, keep this and do not give it back to me even if I am very persuasive. Don't give it back to me. I have to clear my debts and therefore I cannot add more credit to the credit that already exists or to the, de the, the debt that already exists. That's number one. That's soft step number one. The better way is to actually take a pair of scissors and cut up your credit card and it's done. When you finally get disciplined and you use your debit card in such a way that you never ever finish the amount in there, maybe you'll be ready for a credit card and then you can go and apply for a new one. And then you can start using a credit card. But cut it up. Don't use a credit card. Because it will spin you into debt. Okay, number four is you have no emergency fund. If you have no emergency fund that we talked about uh, last week and I believe even the week before, then you are living beyond your means. There is nothing that brings as much peace into a marriage as having the knowledge that my emergency fund is full and therefore I don't need to worry about money. Husbands and wives here, go do this. Put aside, and you can't trust that, you know, the husband will keep the emergency fund. When he's under pressure business-wise, he'll use it. Or the wife will, will keep the emergency fund. When the birthday comes along and she needs her dress by hook or by crook, she's going to use that emergency fund. So how do you put an emergency fund? You put it in a way that it cannot be reached. Put it, for example, in a joint account with need for both signatures and agree together that when you go to ask for the money and your spouse is refusing, they won't stress you. This is something we agreed. Nobody touches that unless we both say we need to withdraw from the emergency fund. In which case then, you take it through the filter of is it a real emergency? Or is this a pretend emergency because we want a new TV and World Cup is coming? That's what the emergency fund is for. If you don't have an emergency fund, you're living beyond your means. Okay, number five, you hide what you buy. Because that means it wasn't budgeted for. It wasn't planned. And therefore you're hiding it and hoping that somehow you can, you can con the other. Or you can con yourself into believing that it was a necessary buy. Number six, you borrow loans from friends and family and workmates on a regular basis. And you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul and from Susan to pay Anne. And then, you know, you have to pay the next one, Susan, you borrowed from. So you borrow from the next person. And you're burning up your friends and your relationships. Because of borrowing money left, right and center. That's a sign you're living beyond your means. Number seven, your total debt burden exceeds 30% of your income, your take home. Your mortgage, your car loan, your, you know, debt, if it exceeds a certain amount, it means that you cannot sustain your lifestyle and you cannot sustain your debt repayment. You're living beyond your means. So these are quick indicators so that you know, okay, um, whether you're living beyond your means. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 20, I'm going to read it in two versions, but listen to what it says, okay? The fool spends money, his money as fast as he gets it. The Bible calls you a fool. Now don't take offense at me. I'm not the one calling you. It's God calling you a fool. If you have no savings, and you're eating everything that comes in. And then you go to ask him, oh God, you know, this bill, oh help me God, help me. And he tells you foolish. Shindwe. 
If I help you with the lifestyle you have, you're only going to increase your lifestyle and continue to be in debt. The fool consumes, spends his money as fast as he gets it. This is the way that the New International Bible puts it, okay? The fool gulps his money down. This man will remain poor and will never create real wealth. But the wise man is like an ant who in the season of plenty... In other words, in the harvest season, in some way or never, stores up so that he has enough for the season of need. Are you a fool or are you a wise man? Your money can tell you by the way you're consuming it. Well, today I want to move on to another principle that I want to give you on how to create wealth. I say that the most important tool to create wealth is what we call a budget. And a budget is nothing more than you giving a job description to the money that lands in your account. That every little shilling has a job to do. And if they do it, you will increase your wealth. If they don't, you will either eat them or they will go and be eaten by somebody else. Because you're going to spend them wantonly and they will not help you. I want to go on now and deal with something a little different, okay? How to create wealth when you've gotten that budget in place. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and you know, um, this was when I lived. I now live, I told you, I now live in uh, Lukenia, um, next to the Daystar University. And my wife and I decided we want to get out of the city, and so we sold our home in the city, and we went and bought 11 acres of farmland out there, and uh, we're doing some farming, and uh, we're building a home there, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so before I moved out of the city, I was having a friend, I was talking with a friend. We used to live in Karen, and we're on an acre of land, so we had quite a lot of land. And uh, we're talking together, and uh, she lived near me, and she told me that bees had landed in a compound. They had found an empty pot in the garden and gone and swarmed in there and started a hive. And she could see them. And she thought to herself, you know, oh, I need to get rid of these bees because, you know, my children could be stung. Or alternatively, you know, we could have a disaster. Somebody passing by there, maybe somebody who would get an aphlectic shock because they're people who are, you know, um, they, 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 it's poison to them. They, are, they react to a bee sting. And when they get stung by a bee, they swell up, their throat tightens, and they can die. And so she decided she needed to get an exterminator to come and remove those bees. And she called one up to come and remove the bees, kill them all and remove them. But then overnight, she thought to herself, the day that the exterminator, exterminator was going to come, in the night she thought to herself, you know, maybe God is blessing me with bees and I'm about to kill them all and throw them out. Okay? So she called the exterminator in the morning and told the exterminator, instead of coming to kill the bees, can you come and I'll buy a hive and you move them into the hive and then show me a safe place to put the bees where they will not be a danger to my family or to, you know, my visitors in the garden, etc., etc. And so the exterminator did that. The exterminator did that. And after a little while, she called him back and asked, can you come and, and help me harvest the honey? And she got, on average, if you have a good hive and you harvest well and the bees have had time to, you know, um, prepare their honey, you will get, on average, about seven to nine kilos of honey per hive. Seven to nine kilos of honey. So he came and he harvested and she thought to herself, Wow, this is free. And so she asked, can I get another hive? And we put bees in there. And he said, sure. You know, what you do is you divide the hive into two. And, uh, you know, the bees will start a second hive. And so she got another hive. And she started a second, you know, uh, uh, hive going. And uh, she got more honey. And she's just started multiplying her hives. At the time I was talking to her, she was now selling honey on the market. She didn't have many hives, maybe about 10 hives or so, but she had enough because you can only eat so much honey. She had enough that she could sell honey on the market. And she had created an income stream that cost almost nothing. Just buying the hives. Bees don't ask for much more. You buy the hives 
and you harvest the honey. If you harvest it yourself, you don't need to pay anything. If you get somebody to harvest it, then you pay probably 2,000, 2,500. They come and harvest it for you. But you're still getting a lot of money because if you have nine kilos and it's a thousand shillings per kilo, that's 2,500 to pay the guy and you are left with a balance of six, 7,000 free of charge. And she had begun a little cottage industry of free money. I'm not a very clever guy. Okay? But when she told me this, I decided even me. And so I went and bought hives. Okay? Since we're living out in Karen, every day on Gong Road, I'd pass these guys who sell these yellow hives and I stopped by and I bought some hives there and I built my hives to five hives doing literally nothing except setting up a home for the bees to come into. And I too began to harvest honey free of charge. Now I'm selling honey. I harvested, I think it was last month, and I figured out that I can actually keep up to 200 hives. And because Mercy is here, and Mercy is a great, you know, honey uh, beekeeper and etc. Last week we were talking with my wife and we said, you know, we need to become Mercy's best friends. We're going to learn from Mercy how to get up to 200. Yes, Mercy. I think you have 2,000 hives or something and so you can teach me. <laughs> you have a lot of hives. You can teach me how to do this. Let me turn to scripture. And bring today's lesson from scripture. One day, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing flame of fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn. This is amazing, he said. Why isn't that bush burning? I must go closer and see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here I am. Moses replied, do not come any closer, the Lord won't. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, uh, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, you know this story, so let me paraphrase it to save a, a little time on reading. Moses, God said to Moses, I want to send you back to Egypt to rescue your people. Because they have cried up to me, and I've heard their cry. And I want you to be the leader to go and, and, and rescue them from Egypt. And Moses said... Great idea, but I'm not, I'm not your man. And God said, you are my man. And Moses said, no, I'm not your man. I can't even speak very well. I stutter. stutter. And God said, no, you know, I'll deal with all that. And Moses, you know, came up with excuses as to why he could not go. And finally, Moses said, look, just, just send somebody else, not me. Please, not me, somebody else. And God spoke to him, and I want to pick it up there, okay? But Moses protested again. This is Exodus chapter 4, okay? What, what if they won't believe or listen to me? What will I say? The Lord never appeared to you. Then God answered him and said, what's that in your hands? And Moses said, oh, oh, this, this is my, you know, kamasai stick to, to you know, hurt the cow, the, the, the sheep. It was a shepherd's stick, Moses replied. And God then said, throw it down on the ground. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back in fright. Then the Lord said to him, reach out and grab it by its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it. And lo and behold, it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. God asked Moses, what is that in your hands? And Moses named it, it's a shepherd's staff, and God used it to turn it into a snake, a snake, an instrument for his use. In the book of Judges, he used the jawbone of a donkey to bring victory to Samson and to Israel, through Samson to Israel. He used an ox goad 
to defeat the Philistines through Shamgar. He used a tent peg in Deborah's hand to defeat the Canaanites. He used trumpets and jars to defeat the Midianites through Gideon. And he used the slingshot in a little boy's teenager's hand, a boy called David, who would become the king of Israel eventually. And he brought down Goliath using a simple slingshot. The lesson is this, guys. God can use anything he wants to accomplish his purposes. Whether it is a jawbone of an ass, which to me and you is a completely useless item that you won't even pick up. Or it is a slingshot, which to you and I is something that little six-year-old boys play with. Or trumpets and jars that you cannot go into battle with. Or even an ox goad, which is simply a stick you use to prod the, the, the cows and the sheep to get them to go into the right direction you want them to go. Useless things. But in God's hands, they come alive and he uses them to accomplish his purposes. God can use anything because the battle belongs to him. But notice the second thing about Exodus chapter 4, Moses' story. The shepherd's stick in Moses' hands was a sign of his profession. We think of, you know, what is it? Um, uh, Doctors, they have their, uh, can I remember the name now? Somebody help me here? Yes, stethoscope, okay? They have that. And when you see, you know, somebody walking down the, the, the hospital with a white lab coat and a stethoscope, you know that's a doctor. It is a sign of his profession. This stick was a sign of Moses' profession. But it was also his authority. Because with it, he could get the job done with the sheep or whatever. And it was also part of his identity. As long as it was in Moses' hands, it was a dead thing. But when Moses put it in the Lord's hands or did what God told him to do with it, it came alive. When Moses picked it up again, it became a dead thing again. When he gave it to God by doing what God was telling him, it became alive again. Some of you here are clutching onto dead careers and dead dreams and dead marriages and dead fruits of futures because you hold on to them and you will not allow God to take hold of them. Your marriage may be dead because when God says, let go, and do what I'm telling you to do with your marriage, you don't want. You think you can control it. You think you can bring it alive. You think you can make it go in the direction you want. If only you would let go and allow God to do what only God can do. And some of that may be, let go and humble yourself. Let me have control of this marriage. Let go and obey and stop fighting at every turn. Let go and stop being the angry man that you are. And I want you to wear a cloak of humility. And I want you to wear a cloak of humbleness. And you're saying, I'm an African man. And you won't let God take control. And so that thing is dead in your hands, even though you would like it to come alive. Some of you have dead businesses here. Because when God tells you, let go and be honest, you still insist and you're trying to tell God, God, you can't do business in this country without bribing the chief and bribing the counselors and bribing whoever it is so that your business can move ahead. And God is telling you, let go. Let me take control of this thing. And so in your hands, like in Moses' hands, it's dead and it's going nowhere. Let me come back. To principle number four. And principle number four is, is simply this. Okay? What's that in your hands? Which is a question that he asked Moses. So here's a truth about wealth creation for us as a children of God. God has given you things that you hold and possess. 
And if like Moses, you would put them in God's hands, God can bring them alive so that they create wealth for you. Give it to God. Do like Moses. Name it. It's just a shepherd's staff. It's just a hobby. It's just a gift. It's just a skill. It's just a relationship. It's just something I do when I want to relax. But in God's hands, it can come alive and create wealth for you. I took this principle and began to ask myself, even on top of my salary as a pastor, what has God put into my hands that I need to take back to him and give to him? I want to give you a couple of the things that God showed to me. What's that in your hands? Number one, if you know me, I have always loved big dogs. And I used to keep dogs, you know, to protect me and for security, for safety and etc. And I thought to myself, I've read everything I can read on dogs. I know, hang on guys, don't get ahead of me, the guys on the thingy. Okay, you're jumping ahead of me. Wait, I'll tell you when I want you to put these things up, okay? Okay, I've always loved dogs, okay? And me, I like my dogs big. These two Japanese pits, I think it's about the worst dog you could ever have. All the time, all the time. You can never sleep, you know. And I, I, and if, for those of you who don't know dogs, there are two dogs here in Kenya you do not want to get. One is the Japanese pits. It has a sharp nose, white. You know, people really love it because it like, looks like a Kanaiska dog and, you know, etc. But it never shuts up. And it snaps. Any of you who keep Japanese pits, you know, it snaps and bites you, okay? The other is called a Jack Russell. A Jack Russell is both, both paranoid and, you know, just, it, it never stops. It's up on the counter, you know, on the, on the, on the table. Then it jumps down on the sofa, the back of the sofa, runs around, you know. It, this is the way it lives. Never get any of those two dogs. If you're going to get a dog, get a terrier, a shih tzu or something. Those ones are calm, quiet. They walk with you, etc., etc. But me, those two little dogs are, is it a rat? Is it a cat? What do you know? What is it? Me, I like big dogs. I like really big dogs, and I, I've always kept big dogs. So God asked me, what's that in your hand? And I thought, my dogs. Okay? I keep two breeds of dogs. I have three dogs in the home I stay in, and I have something like seven dogs at the farm. Okay? And the first breed that I really love to keep are purebred Rottweilers. They are black. Put it up now. They are black. They have red eyes. And they are about, they are about 45, 50 kilos. You don't mess with this dog. They were bred to look after cows, to herd cows. So they have broad chests and they have mass because they need to control the cow and they will thump a cow with their body and get it moving in the right direction. Now they're used for protection. They came from Germany. They went to Britain. British, the British people don't want a curly dog. And so, you know, it was a house dog and they bred out the viciousness of the dog. They went to South Africans. South Africans want a really curly dog because of all the theft. You know that it's been said, that, you know, Johannesburg is a crime capital of the world. So you need, you need real dogs in South Africa. So they bred viciousness into it. They went to America, they wanted a beautiful dog and so, you know, they, they rebred the dog so that it looks beautiful. The ones we get here in Kenya tend to come from South Africa, so they're really curly. And in the night, when the crooks jump over the fence, you can't see the dog because it's black. You just see two red dots coming at you and it's big, 45 kilos for some of you here, it would have you ladies, it would have you for dinner, dessert. Okay? But I breed them, purebred Rottweiler puppies. Okay? Now, there's a second dog that I like even more because it's even bigger. And it's a boar bell. Okay? The South African boar bell. Put up the second, the second picture. This is it. <laughs> okay? This dog... <laughs> Yes, 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 Buana, Buana, Buana Pastor Dominic. You're a man from Kiambu and uh, Meru. Don't come and visit me at 2 a.m. in the night. <laughs> Don't come and visit me in the night, okay? This dog is about 95 kilos. So even the men, this one will take you down. Not many of you are 95. It will take you down. 95 kilos, okay? These are the two dogs I breed. Pure breeds are that. Each 
puppy costs somewhere between 70 and 120,000 shillings. For a dog, a puppy, at two months. Okay? And then what you do is you buy a male and you buy a female from different parents. <laughs> you breed them. This dog doesn't eat, you know, the food that you give the Shenzi dogs. Me, I don't keep Shenzi dogs. You know the Kenyan dog. Okay? There's a difference between this dog of mine and the Shenzi dog. When the thieves come, the Shenzi dog goes under the car. And then I'll say this in, in this heavenly language and I'll explain it for those who don't understand. And from underneath the car, it barks, we now, 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 we now, 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 now. <laughs> and he's asking the question from underneath the car, who are you with? Who are you? How many are you? How many? But it will never come out. This dog of mine can't fit under the car. Okay? It stands and it asks, who? Who? Who are you? So I don't keep Shenzi dogs, okay? It costs 100,000 per puppy. So you're going to spend 200,000 up front. But the dog breeds twice a year. But if you're breeding for good breed, you breed once a year. It will give you 10 puppies. 10 puppies, you bring them up. It will cost you about 20,000 to 30,000. Because they don't eat Shenzi food. They want real food, good food that you cook for them, fresh food, okay? And it grows. And by the time it is two months and you sell it off, you sell each one at a cost of about 100,000. Now, you spend 200,000 on your initial dogs, okay? And then you feed about, you know, 20,000, all the injections, rabies, DHLP, and all those things to keep the puppy safe, and then you sell it. The profit you're making per dog comes to, let's say, at the least, you know, 60, 70,000. And so if you sell, you know, 10 puppies at 60, 70,000, that is 600,000 free of charge per year. And you have one male and maybe four females. It means you get two litters per year. That's about 1.2 million free of charge. And they're guarding you. After all, even your Shenzi dog guards you and you have to feed it. So you're spending money on the Shenzi. But this one, you're spending money, but it's giving you money back. And I thought to myself, I will become a dog breeder because God has put it in my hands. Here's another one, okay? I have a kitchen garden. And in it, we try and grow. The goal of my wife and I is to grow everything we need on our own property. Never to have to go to the supermarket. And it's just a matter of figuring out when to plant, when to harvest, when to plant the seedlings of the next one so that by the time you're finishing harvesting these ones, those ones are ready. And keeping a kitchen garden going at home. And any of you who has even an eighth of an acre free on your compound, that you plant alone. When are you going to go and graze alone like a cow? It will never help you. Plant a kitchen garden and get your food from there. And a kitchen garden doesn't make me money like the dogs, but it saves me money so that I don't have to go shopping. And I know that it has been, though, though that food I'm getting has been grown well without the chemicals. I was with a farmer once and he told me, you know, I told him, yeah, your mbogas look really good. He said, me, easy. He is, where's he cooler? The farmer himself telling me, because before it is harvested tomorrow, he sprays it today to kill all the worms, and then he harvests it tomorrow and sends it to the shops, and you buy it and eat all the chemicals, and no wonder you're having cancer. Him himself, he won't eat. He knows what he's done to his mboga, and he will not eat it himself. So it doesn't make me money, but it saves me money. Okay, with the compound we had, which was one acre, okay, we planted a lot of flowers. Doesn't make me money, but out of it, we had herbs and, uh, you know, spices and thyme and lemongrass and mint and lavender and, and many, many herbs along with the flowers. They don't make me money, but they save me money because we use it for cooking, okay? Now, I also had trees, but the demand I make on my trees like this new farm we've bought, I have something like 500 trees on the, on the five acres that we've developed so far. 500 trees. 
But they have to give me something back in return. If they're not giving me flowers back in return, then they have to give me fruits. So I have something like 20 avocado trees that you wouldn't know until they fruit. I have something like 50 mangoes scattered all over the place. I have many different types of trees, macadamia and whatever else, but they have to give me food. What's that God has put in your hands? For me, it's 10 acres of land. And therefore, he can give me back. I have popos and loquats and avocados and lemons and orange trees and pixies, even apple trees as part of the design of the garden and such. I keep bees and I've explained that. We keep rabbits. Okay, let me tell you about rabbits. We keep rabbits and we keep rabbits for two reasons. Number one, the the meat is very, very good. Rabbits are eaten at about four months they're ready to eat. Don't keep it too long because then it becomes, you know, gumu. But four months, it's at its peak, okay? And that's when you change it and you eat. But the best thing about the rabbit isn't even the, the meat because you can eat, you know, I have sheep and goat and chicken and etc. I can eat that meat, okay? Uh, we've taught ourselves to eat rabbit because it's not a natural meat that Kenyans generally eat. Though now you find more and more rabbit choma places where you can actually buy the meat. It's very lean and uh, it's a special meat, okay? The best thing about a rabbit is the urine. And when you build a cage, you build it in such a way with fiberglass that you collect the urine. And I remember going into my Sukumawiki patch one day and asking my gardener, Hey, your Sukumawiki have become big. Kwani, what are you giving them? And he told me, Susu power. That's rabbit Susu for you. That's what it does. And if you dilute it now for, for, for fertilizer, you have to dilute it 1 to 20 liters of water. 1 liter of rabbit urine to 20 liters of water. But you can also dilute it a little further and use it as an insecticide, organic insecticide. You don't have to buy the chemicals, okay? And there are people who go around asking whether you have rabbits and whether you have any urine to sell. It's that much in demand. Susu power. So I keep rabbits. I harvest as much of the water on my compound as I can because it's free water and you can use it. Did you know that you flush your toilets with drinking water? Drinking quality water. You don't need to. Recycle your water. This is a water-starved country as we are. And the way we build our houses with just one plumbing system is not wisdom. You can put two plumbing systems at almost no extra cost when you're building your house. And you recycle because you have three sources of water. You have the clean water. You have the gray water, what you wash with. You on average use about 20 liters of water every time you shower. But most of that is just a little soap, you know. Um, You don't really have dirt that you're washing down the sink, so to say. And then you have the black water. So there's there's what is called the white water, the, the gray water, and the black water. The gray water is perfect for your kitchen garden, perfect for the grass, perfect for the fence, and you can use it. But because we don't separate them and we have a plumbing system that uses our drinking water to flush the toilet, when we could recycle the grey water, filter it, and put it back in, we, we waste a lot of money. And so it doesn't make you money, but it saves you money. One of the things I keep is chickens, okay, and we sell eggs. And we discovered that we can actually breed Black soldier flies in their thousands so that we can feed the chickens. So if you, if you get my eggs, they are bigger than what you find in the shops and very yellow because they eat black soldier fly. The chickens love them and that's what we feed them for protein so that we can reduce the cost of buying animal feed from the market. And we try and home range them so that they're out in the gardens, in the farm and etc. And they can find their own food. And therefore, we're able to get money from the, you know, from um, the eggs. Moving away from KPNL so that we can now use solar. God has given this country tons of solar. And we live on the equator. We never lack the sun. Even in, the, in July and June, there is enough sunlight that you can actually get off KPNL and learn to live on solar. And so, I run my house on solar. And with the solar, you know, it costs you about 
I don't know, maybe about 600,000 the last time I did it. Ten panels and uh, four batteries. I can run the whole house on everything I need without ever going back to KPNL. And I save a lot of money that way. I keep pigs. I make homemade sausages. And I sell those. And I have sheep. And I have ducks and turkeys and geese and guinea fowls and whatever else. These are the things God has put in my hands. And each one of them can give me a passive income without my needing to put a lot of time and effort into them. Especially if I have the right workers. You have cars. You go to the office and it sits in the parking lot the whole day doing nothing. What's that you have in your hands? Find a good dependable driver and get him to use it as an Uber for you. It will make an income for you. Some of you are good at baking and you could have a cottage industry where you follow up this habit, or you make dresses, or you can write books. What is that in your hands, God would ask you? And if you give it to him, he can bring it alive, and he can make money for you through it and increase your wealth. Multiply your revenue streams, and not just one, okay? I'll tell you the difference between uh, active income, where you get up in the morning, you dress up, you go to work, you work, 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 work the whole day, you come back in the evening tired. And passive income, where whether you're sleeping or you're on holiday or whatever, it's just bringing in money for you without you having to do anything, okay? When you have rentals, for example, you don't have to go there every day and be the watchman. You just find tenants, they live in it, every month they give you money. And it's passive. You can be asleep the whole month. The money will still come. It will still come into your account. That's what passive income is. So you want to increase or multiply your revenue streams, especially with passive income, because passive income doesn't ask for your time and energy. It just brings the money in. Not one, not two, but several revenue streams to increase your income. So here's what you do, okay? Don't expect any of your passive income streams to be a full-scale business. Because when they become a full-scale business, they, they require full-time engagement and it becomes an active income. Keep it small enough that it doesn't actually take your energy. So shares are an example of passive income. Bonds are an example of passive income. Because you don't need to do anything once you have set it up. You just wait for the money to come in and it's not a full-time job, okay? So instead of trying to get the passive income to bring you half a million every month, be happy that it's just bringing you 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 without requiring your energy. When it becomes 500,000 every month, that now becomes a full-time job. You can have passive income as a farm where you do little things like bees and keep chickens and sell eggs, because that's low scale. But when you now say, I want 20,000 chickens, that's a full-time job. And you have to quit where you're working so that you can do this. And it's hard to manage, okay? So passive income, small things. This is what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 2. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight for you do not know what disaster will come upon the land. And that's another good thing about passive income. Because you have diversified, if the egg industry collapses in this country, you've got the honey going. And therefore, it doesn't really affect you. You lose a little, but you can still going on. Ask God to open your eyes and see what he has already put in your hands that right now is a dead stick that he can bring alive. But let me illustrate this idea from the Bible itself. Proverbs 31 tells us about the noble woman. Okay? I want us to read it. And here's what I want you to take note of. This woman that the Bible says is a noble woman. Look at how many little income streams she has. As Ecclesiastes chapter 11, sorry, chapter 11 verse 2 says, invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. So let's read about Proverbs 31. The wo a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her 
and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. So number one, she's got a little cottage industry where she's knitting wool and flax, maybe making cardigans or something. Verse 14, verse 14 it says this. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. Okay, and then it goes on to verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. So she's into real estate and she's buying property, maybe selling it off, okay? And then um, it continues on to say, out of her earning, she plants a vineyard. So she's also a farmer, okay? That's income stream number three. Verse 17, she sets out her work vigorously. Her arms are strong with her for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable. So she's also trading. She's keeping a kiosk or she has like a small duka or something and she's trading. And it goes on. And her lamp does not go out at night. In her hands, she holds a distaff, which is really uh, one of these sherehanis. You know, the, the, the ones that you make cloth and etc. She holds a distaff and grasps a spindle with her fingers. So she's making cloth at night. And it tells us what she does with it. Goes on to verse 20. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She's making clothes for her children, for her household. She makes bed covers for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and in purple. She provides her family with clothes and she provides them with blankets and with linen and whatever else she needs. May not make a lot of money, but it saves her having to go and buy clothes, okay? That's number six. Number seven, her husband is respected at the city gate when, where he talks, takes his seat among the elders. She makes linen garments and sells them. So she's not only providing for her family, she now has a product that she can take to the market on top of supplying her family. And then her cottage industry number eight, she supplies the merchants with sashes, which are cloth, fine cloth that you tie around your body, colored, dyed, everything. And she supplies the merchants with sashes for sale. She has eight little cottage industries. Guys, if any of you have a wife like this, you, even you will boast about her. And she, yeah, okay? You have a wife like this. Yeah. <laughs> I know your wife is very industrious, Pastor Dominic. Here's what it goes on to say in verse 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks, she has no worry. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done. And let her work bring praise to her at the city gate. This is a woman with eight cottage industries. Salary or not, she's bringing in what she needs to provide for her family and to care. And we're not even talking about the husband because the focus here is on the wife. Guys, what is that that God has put into your hands? And would you give it back to him and let it become alive? as he uses it to create wealth for you. God bless you.